So thank you all again for joining us for the Millcraft Meetup this month. Um, for those of you that joined us back in January, our first meetup of the year, you heard our Chief Operating Officer, Greg Lovensheimer, say the word to describe 2021 would be volatility. Well, I don't know about you, but five months into this roller coaster ride of a year, um, just when we think about it from the commercial print standpoint, the paper standpoint, coded paper, coded boards, I mean, really the industry is reeling across the board. Um, there have been nothing but volatility and what the future holds, who knows, but our CEO Greg is joining us again today. We are very, very happy to welcome him back to the meetup. Greg is going to share his insights into what we can expect um, into the back half of 2021. So with that, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Can you all hear me okay? Still good? All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sitting here in a uh, hotel room in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So uh, hopefully uh, we don't get any background noise coming through and hopefully the uh, Wi-Fi here holds out. So uh, again, thank you for, for showing up. Obviously, you all have a passionate interest in the graphics uh, paper industry and uh, just love to be able to, to share our insights and thoughts into kind of uh, what's happening kind of behind the scenes that'll ultimately manifest itself in. So would love it if you've got questions, you know, put them in the chat feature. We've got a whole team of folks that'll be able to comb through those and make sure we were able to answer those. And hopefully maybe if I've done my job well enough, I maybe thought about some of your questions ahead of time, potentially, okay? So just at a high level, and I'm not tooting my horn, but just, I know sometimes go, who, who in the heck are you and why do you, why does your opinion matter? Right, and so I do have a probably a unique perspective in the fact that I've spent about 32 years in the industry, about 25 at it with with uh, you know a paper mill that was both on the coded side of the market as well as the uncoded side of the market. So maybe I have a different or maybe a, a unique perspective that uh, there are certainly others out there that have a, uh, a you know maybe a keener insight, but uh, maybe just um, different. Um, my insight's really a function of the relationships and the friendships that I've built with over time. So I love this uh, African philosophy uh, of Ubuntu, meaning uh, I am because we are. And so I am here today because of the uh, relationships, the friendships, the partnerships, the suppliers that we have with Millcraft that have shared just a tremendous amount of information and perspective that helped kind of craft this message for today. And so um, there's a giant void right now in the marketplace, in my opinion, uh, in terms of, you know, you, you know, because of COVID, you know, we're not able to meet for trade shows, we're not able to meet for expos, and so there's a, a gap of information, and everyone's kind of thirsting for knowledge, and so, um, you know, at Millcraft, we've tried to really partner with our suppliers and bring some perspective to some of the things that are going on, so hopefully helps you and your business uh, be better situated to, to survive slash thrive in 2021. So I do want to thank all the folks from Sappy, Verso, Lecta, Westrock, Pixel, Domtar, IP, and I'm probably leaving out some others, but because of your help and your assistance makes all this possible. So the questions you're probably asking yourself as you're thinking about 2021 are a variety of things. Why can't I get the paper I need? Why is freight so expensive? Why are my deliveries not on time? Are imports really 12 to 16 weeks out? Why are there so many price increases and why are they coming so fast? What is an allocated market and how should I think about that? Who's even left in the industry to compete with? And probably the most important and impactful question we all probably need to be asking ourselves is that last one. How will 2021 be different than 2018? And I'll talk about that here in a second about why those uh, pieces, why that question really does matter. Uh, because, you know, 2018 was an allocated market. 2018 was a uh, cost price escalation out of control market. Um, and there was a lot of things that went on in 2018 and 2019 that I know the industry is trying to make sure doesn't uh, reoccur in 2021. So let's talk about kind of this is a high level what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about where we were in 2021. As Jill said, you know, we did this on I think, January the 9th. And we I use that term of volatility, that that was the one word to describe the market. And, uh, you know, it's it's turned out to be pretty much uh, spot on. 
um, and things continue to change and things continue to happen. Um, we'll talk about the general economic update. We'll obviously touch on COVID because you can't talk about the economy in today's market without having the backdrop of where COVID and vaccinations are. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about print demand and kind of where the industry sees itself. And then we'll kind of really switch gears and turn about, talk about the challenges that are still to come in 2021, um, both from a supply demand, lack of imports, because in my opinion, that's the key is the lack of imports in the market right now that differentiates 2018 from 2021. Uh, and then what are the opportunities that you should be seeking out for your business to really help you grow and thrive in 2021? And how can supply chain partnerships really benefit you? So let's look back at, the, like I said, January 9th, we talked about, um, you know, kind of our first state of the industry for this year. But keep in mind, we've been doing these states of the industries all the way back in 2017. We kind of read the tea leaves back in October 7th of 2017. We did a presentation in Indianapolis for our customers that talked about if these events remain unchanged, there's going to be an allocated market. And we talked about the fact that how many of us don't even don't even know what an allocation model looks like or a moratorium, heaven forbid, even looks like. And so we started talking then. And, you know, and again, it's not because of me or Millcraft. It's because of who we are as a, as a supply chain, we're able to bring the leverage and the knowledge and the information to kind of bear. We talked about all the capacity closures. We talked about days of inventory on hand. We talked about all the freight challenges. Uh, and then we talked about kind of where pricing was kind of headed. And if you remember at that time, we said, expect four price increases in coded market. You should expect three price increases in uncoded. Okay. So think about where we've come in a very short period of time just since then with regards to the four and the three. So let's talk about the economy, right? So you can't talk about the economy without talking about COVID. Right now there's uh, 28 cases reported over the last seven days. That's a 35% reduction in the last two weeks. And so you're getting this crossover of the amount of vaccination arising to the point where it's having a tipping point effect in the number of cases. We're averaging about 1.8 million doses of vaccine given every day. Right now, 47% of all US adults who are eligible are in fact truly vaccinated. The question, the conundrum I know is, you know, the CDC just came out lifting the mask mandates for fully vaccinated people. But, you know, those of us that are in business, we all understand that OSHA still holds the Trump card out there. OSHA still has this uh, emergency temporary standard that they've been challenged by the Biden administration to come up with that could impact how businesses are supposed to uh, set up their, their operation to protect their employees. So there's an employee responsibility that supersedes what the public is allowed to do. And so that's where it's still a little bit of a conundrum. And that's why you see folks like um, Kroger, for example, saying they're staying with the standard, right? They're staying with all their, their testing, all their social distancing, all their masks. They don't care what the CDC says because they know they have a liability issue, right? They, they know they have this liability issue. Whereas us in the general public, if you're out on a weekend, you know, enjoying time with your family, you're not wearing a mask if you're fully vaccinated because you're saying, hey, the CDC. So right now it's a little bit of, you know, whose standard uh, has a precedent is it the CDC in my personal life? And is it, you know, kind of OSHA in, in business? And so that's the conundrum that I know a lot of you are all facing. So when does the new normal re actually return, right? So here, here's some really good information from a perspective of a variety of folks. Um, you know, looking at retail sales, they're actually surging in March. Um, so these are month over month. And so right now, you know, sports and hobbies, people are outside, especially as you know, spring has arrived and summer starts to arrive at the end of this month. Um, you know, people are outside, they're engaging in sports, up 24% retail sales month over month compared to February. You know, clothing is the new boom. You know, the one thing that we all did in lockdown, or at least I do, I don't buy clothes online because I can't find any fit me, but they may just be a personal statement. Um, but so now that retail sales start to open up, you go in and you try clothes on and it's a wonderful thing. And so you will see retail sales really start to drive as people start getting back and, you know, wanting to, you know, uh, you know refresh their apparel. Um, you know, and you kind of flip the, the coin returning to normal activities. 
right? That sporting events are just starting to open up. Those of us that are, you know, baseball fans, you know, in the state of Ohio, at least they're, you know, the, the stadiums are reopening full time beginning in, in June, uh, you know, travel and leisure is really going to start to take off, you know, uh, airline bookings uh, are up dramatically. Um, you know, you, you go through an airport and it looks, you know, not quite like 2019, but it certainly doesn't look like 2020. It's getting closer to, to looking like what 2019 looks like. You know, return to work, you know, in the Midwest, we're maybe a little insulated. Um, and the fact that, you know, we may have returned to work a little faster than others and maybe shut down a little later than others. Um, the East Coast and the West Coast obviously have been on lockdown. Um, and depending on, you know, your, your state's, you know, governance, um, you know, kind of impacted when return to work looks like. Um, but the expectation would be by the third and fourth quarter of this year, everyone will be back to return to work, whatever that now looks like, because obviously uh, with, with COVID, there may be a, a material shift in the way a lot of employers, um, you know, staff and have need for office space right now and, and fully return to, to school in the fall of 2021. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a unique situation and it's very volatile and you can read about it in the, the, the newspapers just in terms of the teachers union and uh, compared to, you know, vaccination rates and whatnot. So that's when the expectation is of, of the new normal. And we're starting to see it come back in, you know, the economy, right? In terms of the number of people that are getting back to work, you know, the, the jobless claims, actually this slide literally just came out this morning. Um, you know, the jobless claims just came out and it's 440,000 new filings for jobless claims. That's the lowest uh, that's we've had since the pandemic, you know, un unemployment still in that three, six, uh, you know, uh, there's 3.6 to 3.7 million people still unemployed. But what you're starting to see now is that states are starting to turn off the spigot to all of the additional $300 or additional supplemental benefits of unemployment, trying to kind of um, set the stage for people to return to work. And so this part of the slide here, really starts to talk about, you know, when some of these ending or the cutoffs for all of these extra jobless benefits start to kick in. So, you know, Alaska's kicking in in, you know, the uh, June, middle of June, uh, Ohio's the end of June, Tennessee's the first of July. So, you know, states are starting to set the stage for getting people back to work because as the, as the economy picks back up, one of the pacing factors of economic growth is our ability as a country to fuel people in jobs that make things happen, whether that's wait on tables, whether that's serve you at a bar, whether that's work in a warehouse, whether that's, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of those uh, positions need to be filled and we need to tap into that, you know, 3.6 million uh, still unemployed. You know, and it's manifesting itself in, in print. Uh, March was, you know, $7.4 billion, a very strong uh, um, return off of that $6.4 billion, which was, you know, the low mark in February. And so that volatility that we talked about is still there in terms of, you know, this kind of level of performance in February uh, for commercial printing shipments kind of bounce back immediately and you go to $7.4 billion. It's the second best March in the last five years. And so it's a wonderful thing to see. We're starting to see quoting activities and hopefully you're seeing that in your business. You're seeing quoting activity starting to pick back up, you know, and, you know, print is in fact rebounding. And the statement of that is you look no further than books. You know, the, the one thing that COVID really did in some cases it accelerated some demand destruction, but in some cases it really helped us as a society focus on kind of what matters and kind of where would we rather spend our time. And the reality is amidst COVID, people flocked to reading books and it's an 8.2% year over year increase. And so those of you that are in trade book publications, uh, you absolutely know that. I talked to one printer um, that, you know, talked about the fact they added 32 HP Indigos over a 32 week period last year, just to keep up with the demand. The book industry looks very different than it did 10 years ago, right? There's no big gang runs. It's a lot of print on demand, but the demand for books is absolutely still out there. And the wonderful thing about the book industry is it's pivoted, if you will, 
to being flexible and nimble, you know, and uh, the same customer talk about, you know, when Anthony Bourdain passed away, um, immediately they were able to get his, you know, kind of book that he'd already published several years earlier, they were able to get it back on the shelves within a couple days of his passing because it was top of mind and it drove incremental sales that never would have been there because the, the supply chain couldn't respond fast enough. And again, what a wonderful, resilient statement to talk about the book publishing industry when everyone had kind of written it off for dead and said, you know, the Kindle was going to kill it. It's just different. And it's because the, the, the folks in this industry that were able to, to, to pivot to make that happen. So let's talk about, you know, we all are feeling a little bit of this lack of inventory and, and it's no different than our, our own daily life. You know, whether you're buying an appliance, um, you know, buying pressure treated lumber, those of you that are doing housing projects, you know, a lot of housing projects got put on hold because the prices have escalated. You know, I personally just put a, a, a deck addition onto my house and, you know, a two, a two by, excuse me, a four by eight sheet of plywood, you know, tr pressure treated would have cost me normally $24. It was $48 if I could find it. Um, and it's just, it, it's where inventory levels are. So it's not just paper. It's not just in pressure treated lumber. It's in appliances. Go try to find a, you know, certain uh, appliances, a, a dishwasher, a microwave. Go try to find a car right now. Um, you know, the, the chip shortage um, is really driving um, some of this. And you, you, it's an all-time low for inventory to sales ratios. And that's what this chart over here is trying to show you is this is retail trade, real inventories of, of um, nominal inventory compared to the sales dollar value. That is an all-time low right there at 1.1, all right? All right. But the reality is you have to back out the automotive component. So yeah, this would say inventories are down and the inventory levels compared to sales dollars are actually at an all time low. If you pull out the automotive piece, because remember we all know what they're struggling with with regards to microchips and cars. And that's what, you know, is creating a situation where Hertz now is adding rental cars into their fleet that are actually used cars, not new cars because they can't get enough used cars. Um, if you pull out the automotive, you get this slide. And so really 32% of this number over here is actually driven by um, the automotive market. So when you pull that number out, it has a dramatic effect. And it really starts to show you that, in fact, inventory levels are, in fact, starting to creep up. But guess what? Sales have accelerated dramatically. And so it's still a suppressed level. And so we're all still consuming. We're all still we're, we, you know, we've got more dispendable, you know, cash at our ready and uh, we, you know, we are consuming inventory, but in fact, inventories are building behind the scenes. And again, that's that tipping point. As you think about an allocated market, keep that in the back of your head when we start talking about, you know, just 2018 and 20 repeat itself in 2021. And the other thing to keep in mind is, is the Texas ice storm. Some folks, you know, if you, if you had, family or friends that were in that area. Uh, we just need to be mindful of that deep freeze that happened earlier this year in Texas. And the reality is that whether you can appreciate it or not, the, the mills that are supplying paper, especially coated paper, are still feeling the effects of that outage. And so these are just two pictures that kind of show you the, the depth of destruction um, that kind of went on. Imagine, you know, all these pipes all the, the miles and miles and miles of piping that needed to be placed, replaced, all the valves, all the pumps, um, you know, just, you know, dramatic um, destruction. And really what that kind of manifest itself in was this styrene shortage. And so what is styrene, right? It's a net, it's a derived product of natural gas, but more importantly, it goes into the latex and latex goes into coatings and those coatings are used in paper and they're used to help print and they're used as toner anchorage devices. They're used to give you gloss on your sheets. They're used to give you um, water um, um, uh, resistant properties in some papers and or packaging. And you know, historically, the industry has relied on Texas to be especially food grade latex. Comes from Texas, kind of commercial, everyday run of the mill latex styrene comes from China. And so what you see is this kind of um, dichotomy of if it's a product that is derived from China, it really hasn't seen a blip. If it's a food grade product, you've seen the blip 
because of you know the the need to get that latex um, or that styrene out of Texas. And so it's again, it's one of those things that you may not have even considered. You may not put it had it in the thought in your head as to how does something in West Texas impact something you know that uh, is going to hit me in my pocketbook and my printing business. Let's flip the, the dial over to freight now because this impacts all of us and it continues to. And so we spent a lot of time in January talking about freight and where freight was and uh, the, there was really no remedy kind of in sight. And the unfortunate reality is that is in fact the case. It continues, domestic trucking continues to be a real challenge. There is a lack of drivers. The age of the driver is getting older. The average age right now, I think is 61 and a half years old. Uh, there's no news coming in because guess what? Because of COVID, we turned off all the driving schools. We couldn't have ride-alongs. So there were no new drivers really added last year. So there's 200,000 fewer drivers right now, um, according to a couple of estimates. And that's really pushed wages for drivers over $30 an hour right now for a class A CDL. We were talking in January that people were getting concerned as you got closer to the $25 level because it was just 20 the year before. The reality is that long haul drivers right now are in grave demand because there's a 90% turnover on long haul routes, right? No one wants that route, right? No more, gone are the days of BJ and the bear for the other, those of you that can remember that TV show, right? Um, you know, and so it's, it's, you know, it's now um, a challenge. Does the industry start looking at busing options for trucking, kind of the way Southwest does air travel, going from hub to hub to hub? Is that the way trucking is going to need to become? Because the reality is there's going to be a sincere lack of drivers. You know, they can pump out trucks all they want until you get somebody that's kind of behind the wheel. Um, it's, it's, you know, really doesn't matter. And then couple that with the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. So the wonderful thing that happened several years ago is, is finally the industry uh, came, and we talked about this in January, came together and said, we're putting a clearinghouse so that everyone needs to report on their class or their CDL drivers so that people can't play games. Because historically, if I was a, if I was a driver and I failed my drug test, I could just quit working for you go down the street, start working from somebody else, and they have no idea. It never kind of appeared on my record. It, my, my drug and alcohol screen never really followed me, if you will. The reality is now that's no longer the case. Now, if you uh, hire and retain CDL drivers, you're obligated to have this clearinghouse, and you're obligated every year to do a, a driver check. Uh, and as you hire new drivers, you have to um, uh, get a check in advance, if you will. Here's the unfortunate reality right now, according to the Federal Motor um, Carrier Safety Administration, March 2021 report, 15% of drug and alcohol uh, tests are actually end up in a refusal. So they're considered a, a positive because they failed, they, they didn't want to take the test. And so again, that drives drivers out of the marketplace. Again, freight going up. And then here's how it manifests itself, right? So there's the freight costs. You know, trucking volumes right now are one and a half times what they were in 21, or excuse me, in, in 19 in, in 2020. And they're still about, believe it or not, 35% higher than where they were in, in 2019. The reality is, as an industry, we stopped buying from the mall and we started getting deliveries to our home. And as a result, that meant more freight on the road. Just look at how many Amazon trucks you see running around they're running around with smaller packages versus a full 53 foot truck or a, a, um, a rail car filled with products and so we've got more product on the road being you know direct to customers uh, and it has really displaced this this retail traffic 400 billion dollars being direct shipped to customers is a big deal and so what that's done is really driven the freight number through the roof and so right now the cost of freight is still bouncing around that five-year high, almost $3.23 a mile for the last seven-day average. We all feel that. You're feeling it in the prices you pay for the products. You're feeling it in the raw materials you're buying for your business. You're feeling it on the outbound shipping of the products that you're selling. And the reality is we're at record level rejection rates, meaning a load gets tendered, offered for to be, to be serviced, and 
about 28% of the time, those loads don't find a home. And so again, it's a real situation where truck capacity, you may wait several days before your product fits someone's wheelhouse and then they want to pick it up. And so there's absolutely, there's a condition where freight sitting on the dock. Uh, we had a situation ourselves where we had freight sitting on a dock in Minnesota and it took over a week to find a carrier that was willing to bring it uh, down to the Midwest. Again, there's a lot of, you know, competing factors out here. And we all know about a, a little bit about the international freight challenges. So this, this is a, these are two pictures of the port of Long Beach, right? And so I used this picture earlier in the year for my Millcraft colleagues, because I think it just does a wonderful, it, it, you, you can't describe what you see here in terms of the fact that there's about 52 container ships anchored offshore, just waiting, just waiting to get in. And this is what it looks like on a radar dot in terms of all the vessels that are just kind of hovering around and waiting to be unloaded. Um, you know, it's, it's really been the perfect storm as we've all consumed more because of COVID and we shut down factories domestically. We've gone over to, especially to Asia for a lot of the products that we bought. Guess what? Those are coming in on, you know, ocean vessels. Guess what? They still had trouble getting, you know, longshoremen to unload them and people to operate the steamship lines. In fact, there's a really interesting story that C.H. Robinson put out on the industry uh, trade rags that talked about the con that uh, Nike was really struggling to get their shoes from Asia to the U.S. and that they really wanted to make sure they hit the spring season, especially as there was a, still a lot of money, um, you know, disposable income in people's pockets. Nike absolutely wanted to take advantage of it. They could not get access to containers. Their products, they didn't have, basically, they, they, they weren't willing to pay enough to get access to the containers. The, the ships were sailing. It's just a matter of how much money does it take to get your load on that ship. Nike ended up buying 300 containers on one steamship alone. Normal cost would have been around $3,000 per container. They paid $17,000 per container. It's the difference of $540,000 for freight versus $5.1 million in freight. It's a real meaningful impact. And guess what? Who do you think is going to absorb that cost? It's not Nike. It's going to be passed on to the consumer. And so as you start to look at your Nike shoes, when you go to the mall, you're going to see that price go up because Nike needed to get those shoes off the factory floor and into the market. And they couldn't. They had to buy their way on the boats. That similar philosophy, keep that in mind when we start, when we go to talk about allocation, because that similar approach is, is really there. It's, it's not a matter of, is there a boat that's moving? There absolutely is a boat that's moving. It's just a matter of, are you willing to pay enough to get on the boat, right? Similar story with, uh, you know, some of our import partners from Europe. They've, they realize if they're going to be a player in the U.S., they've got to continue to be in the U.S. There is no container price that's too high. And they are starting to get you know product moving on shore and so you're starting to see some of the coded imports from europe at least now really starting to flow because we've hit that tipping point of the cost of a container versus the cost of not shipping um is is you know kind of you're coming to that confluence employment challenges still abound right you know uh, everyone's struggling to fill entry-level positions you know there's even some reports that as as the economy picks up and as paper demand picks up, there's a lot of our non-integrated supply chain partners, a lot of mills that simply cannot start their paper machines back up because they can't get enough qualified people to operate the equipment. That's a reality. Similar situation, I just heard about an envelope producer. They were ready to go back into production on several envelope lines. They could not get enough qualified people to operate the line, so therefore they cannot produce. So these challenges absolutely do exist. I did throw this in there. I was on a, a National Association of Wholesale Distributors um, uh, virtual conference and Corn Ferry was on. And they really talked about, you know, what do you need to do as, a, as an employer to really trigger the, the, you know, someone to even consider you. And so they talked about $100 gift cards just for showing up to an interview. That a lot of people have resorted to paying people to show up for the interview just because they were seeing a, a interview participation rate drop below um, 60%. So think about that, you know, 60% of the time that you know, the, the employer or the potential employee does not show up.
So it talked about, you know, as, as employers, we all need to consider ourselves or put ourselves in the mindset of a um, kind of a division one college program. When you're trying to attract the talents of an athlete, what do you do? You, you wheel and you whine and you dine, you make, you improve the locker room, you improve the experience, you improve, you know, where the kid stays on campus. Um, you put all those intangibles in place. And Corn Ferry's comment was as employers, you need to be thinking about what are the things that you're doing with the facility? What does it look like? How clean is it? Is it look uh, fun and inviting? Um, is it vibrant? Are the things that you can do, um, you know, whether that's vending machines or uh, 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 juice services, believe it or not, it it's all needs to be on the table because it's all in the heads of, you know, what, why do I want to work here besides the money? And so we've all got to come to that rationalization. You know, as I turn the page, you know, thinking about the state of the, the graphics paper industry, we've got to keep, keep all those things in mind. Employment challenges, freight challenges, um, you know, cost challenges, because they all come to play uh, as we roll through the, the state of the industry. So this was a slide that, uh, um, you know, kind of Rissy put out, Rissy Fast Markets put out, and it talks about, it, it's kind of a great grounding rod for kind of where we are. So at a high level, these two these two um, lines right here are um, coded free sheet is in the green, the um, uncoded free sheet is the black, printing and writing grades, because they can straddle the line between the two, um, is kind of that that red line that's in between. Really what I wanna hide out, highlight for you, and they talk about here are all the capacity closures that have happened. The, the, the nuts and bolts of what we're gonna talk about is this little gap right here. So this little volatility in 2018 is when we saw prices go up, but then we saw prices come down and this is all about capacity, right? So this is the amount of utilization. So we're, I'm gonna talk about capacity at a, at a uh, paper producing facility, paper and packaging facility, you never get to 100%. So think about a paper and packaging machine has some theoretical limit. It's the most that I can make if I never shut that machine off. The reality is the machine has to be turned off at some point for general maintenance, weekly maintenance, bi-weekly maintenance. There are things that you have to do and maybe even annual maintenance. So you never really run the machine at full tilt. In fact, what most folks would tell you in the industry is somewhere around, you know, 87 to 90 is, is ideal. Anything you get above 91 and now you're getting tight, 92, you're full. And so what you're seeing is that at some points, you know, early on in 2018, we almost hit 100, but we've been there already um, in the coded free sheet market um, this year. And so here's the other challenge is... What, we, what happened in 2018 was probably a lack of information as much as anything else, and we'll talk about this. And so you, what you really had were the mills continue to rely on their inventory levels, right? And they looked at their inventory levels and they continue to go down and they continue to go down. They saw their operating rates go up and they assumed that everything that they were producing was being consumed when in fact it wasn't. There was this Costco hoarding effect similar to toilet paper in 2020. Every merchant, every broker, every printer that had size and scale did what? They hoarded paper. We all did it, right? Because we were trying to beat a price increase. And so what happened was everybody didn't really, the, the demand really wasn't true. We were all just hoarding stock. We also know that there were a lot of folks that put in large blocking orders into paper machine backlogs, and they were just speculative tons. And so especially as we got towards the end of 2018, there was a lot of late last minute LDC changes where the tons evaporated out of the deck as the L, as the last date to change the LDC came up, those tons evaporated because they were all speculative tons just holding for a what if. So it was really a house of cards. And unfortunately, the mills didn't have really good insight as what, are, what does a printer's inventory look like? What does a merchant's inventory look like? What does a broker's inventory look like? They were looking at theirs. They didn't see the complete picture. That's the lesson learned this time. The mills are very much cognizant of how much inventory is on our floor. And they they guess, they have you know improved tools to start looking at what's on your floor. Because again, they don't want to repeat um, the issues from 2019 where the bottom of the market basically fell out. 
Okay. So the reality is that there's growth in the forecast in almost every segment in print. The challenge is, the challenge is, can you get access to the supply that you need to grow in order to participate in that growth? Right. So if I look at catalogs, it's expected to, to, to grow this year. If I look at commercial print, general commercial print, up 5%. Even look at magazine ad pages, two and a half. If I look at book, uh, um, it's going to grow by four, almost 4%. So the opportunity is absolutely there. This is what the data would say is that the demand for the products that you all produce are in fact there. The question is, do you have the right supply chain so that you can participate in that level of growth. We'll talk about that here in a second, because here's what the reality is the mill uh, situation regards to. So we talked about that kind of uh, operating rate, that theoretical, remember the 100% is, is too much and it's really somewhere between you know 91 and 92 is absolutely full. So this is uncoded free sheet, right? So uncoded free sheet in 2021 right now, Uncoded free sheet in the month of March was 99% operating rates in uncoded free sheet. What does that mean? How is that possible? That means they were pulling down inventory. That means the inventory in a Domtar, a Pixel, an IP are starting to evaporate. RDCs are starting to dry up. It's even worse in the coded free sheet segment. So a SAPI and a Verso, they're, you know, they're at 113%, okay, in 2021 that's just unsustainable. You're basically imploding your RDCs. And that's what you actually see. A lot of mills cut off their number threes being accessible in the RDCs. And it's now all mill direct. You want to buy these products at the bottom of the margin stack. If you want to buy these products, you got to go mill direct and you're going to wait your turn for them to come in because right now they can sell every pound of paper they can absolutely produce. So Right now, the, the reality is RDCs are absolutely empty. And you really start to see this in, in, in the kind of this view. So this is the coded free sheet challenge slide. This is the overall inventory levels right now. So coded in, inventories right now have drawn down 232,000 tons since the July peak. That's eight consecutive months in a row of, of, of pulling down, right? Right now, coded free sheet inventories are at their lowest level in over 30 years. That's 1990 if you need to do the math, right? Day's inventory on hand has been cut in half. And keep in mind, day's inventory on hand is, an in, is, a, is relative to the amount of demand that's being pulled off of it. So as demand starts to pick up, that number is going to plummet, okay? So it's really, um, you, you got to be able to look at these two charts together. What is my overall inventory? And what's my overall inventory relative to the demand that exists in the market? This would lead you to believe you've got enough to survive. This is where the, the kind of the market's kind of really existed. The reality, that's not the case. You're going to start to see more like 2018 level volumes in terms of days inventory on hand starting to drop below 50 and getting to those high 40s as the economy starts to rebound because there's just not enough capacity keep in mind, we, we talked about this in January, there's so much capacity that's been taken out. There's not, a, there's not enough of a shock absorber left in the system that can fill all the demand that needs to be there so that everyone can participate at, in the growth simultaneously. So there will be a pecking order. There will be a sequence in which the, the tons get allocated back. And then uncoded, it's very similar. This is the lowest inventory on record lowest inventory level on record at 453,000 tons. Now, but if you go look at the day's inventory on hand, it looks balanced. The reality is there is no room in the end for growth, right? It is where it is. It's setting right now nicely, but as opportunities pick back up, as, you know, as potentially, you know, new book volumes start to drop, as commercial print starts to take off, as retail starts to pick up, as hospitality um, you know, restaurant and dining, uh, all that starts to really start to, to, to trigger. There's not enough, you know, capacity here in the short term to be able to, you know, feed everyone simultaneously. There's just not enough capacity. And the SBS market. So I know last time in January, I didn't have a really good SBS market. So 
thank you um, to the to the folks that really helped here. This is actually a West Rock so slide, courtesy of them. And you can see that their SBS rates, you know, for their industry and what they would speculate others is about 92%. They're basically at capacity. Keep in mind, you also have to throw in the fact that they've had latex issues. They've had natural gas issues. The colonial pipeline issues that we all think about, you know, what was the, you know, was it like for those that lived in Atlanta and Charlotte in terms of at the gas pump, but they absolutely impacted, you know, this market. And, you know, oh, there's also the West Rock cybersecurity issue, you know, that took them offline for a period of time, right? And so right now the backlogs are off the chart. They're approaching six weeks for SBS in that, in that marketplace. The other piece of the puzzle is pulp. And so, yes, most of the supply chain partners, those of you that have, have listened to our uh, presentations since, since 2017, you know, we talked about early on that it was the amount of people that were um, fully integrated. And those would be the long-term sustainable suppliers. You had to have your own capacity to produce pulp to be a long-term sustainable supplier. The reality is there's still uh, a need for niche, you know, producers that need to buy market pulp. And so that will always exist in, to, some, to some degree. The reality is right now that you know, the prices in the pulp market are, are reaching levels that they've only touched in the last decade. Only two times in the last decade are they approaching this level. So NBSK, Northern Bleach Softwood Craft, strength, long fiber, strength. So it's used in a lot of packaging grades. You know, it's well off the charts. And that's why you're you know, seeing this and you'll, it'll see it get manifest itself in some of the SBS prices that you see, as well as some of the other prices. Um, you know, the Southern Bleach Craft, it's right there with it. And then this is the Northern uh, Hardwood, uh, kind of mixed. So hardwood fibers, remember the smaller ones, they fill in the print, make a, a nice, beautiful printed image. The reality is that the pulp market, as much as we don't think about it necessarily directly, are absolutely having an impact in terms of the cost headwinds that a lot of mills face because here's the reality. This is the this is a chart that talks about paper pricing over time. This green line represents the cost of NBSK, Northern Bleach Softwood Craft, right? And this blue and red line represents where kind of the bellwethers of both coated free sheet and uncoated free sheet sit. So 60 pound coated number threes and then 50 pound offset rolls. All right, so that's kind of what this tracks. The reality is this gap between what it costs me to, to buy pulp versus what I get to sell it for on the other side, that's an unsustainable value gap. We used to call that at the mill, that's actually value destruction. You can make more money selling pulp out the front end than adding cost to it and you know adding the extra steps to make paper. So that's unsustainable. So We'll see over the next several months if pulp starts to rebound. Right now, uh, a new pulp price increase just went in, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, I saw it come in. So, again, that's another indication. Remember we talked about we're going to be four price increases encoded and three and uncoded? Again, this is some of the underpinnings of why that occurs. Now, we talked about how is 2018 not going to repeat itself or re manifest itself in 21 and really got to look at kind of imports. And it's really this, this lack of imports. That's what's holding the market, if you will, in check, because think back to all the freight slides we talked about, right? We know that there's freight slot, there, there's freight pressures that are out there. We know that because if you were to buy a container right now, the container is about two times as expensive on the West coast as getting coming, basically coming from Asia than it is from the East Coast. So you're gonna to start to see more Europeans sooner than you will the Asians. And it's just because the cost of a container, the cost of getting access to that ship is just that different um, beca because all the goods that you and I buy, all the things that we click on on Amazon, guess where they're sourced? China, Asia, right? And so, paper and, and pulp and those products have got to overcome the demand of a Peloton bike, right? Uh, and that's what creates a challenge. So imports have really been thwarted, uh, especially from Asia due to this, the, these freight issues. You know, the reality is the containers that we're doing in January are just now showing up in the market. 
And there's a fear that import arrivals are really what's keeping pricing in check because North American suppliers don't want to reach a price point where importers will absolutely pay that premium to get on the ship. They don't want to see, you know, they don't want to see folks do what Nike did and pay big dollars to make the things move because they want to participate in the market. Because the reality is, no matter how uh, much the other markets around the world grow and develop, the North American marketplace for graphic papers is still the best on the planet. Everyone, and that's why you see everyone want to be here. And that's why everyone never tried not to leave. The only reason they got stuck and they couldn't become here is because of the freight issue. It wasn't because they didn't want to, they couldn't get it here. So this is what you know, we need to be mindful of. This is what's going to kind of keep things in check to allow 2018 to not really repeat itself. And you really see this um, in this slide um, that talks about the coded imports, because this is where it's most significant. I'll, I'll talk about that because the coded industry, the coded free sheet marketplace is more, um, it, it demands more imports just to be balanced. The reality is, and I've got a slide coming up here in a second that talk about kind of what's the supply possibilities versus what's the true demand. The reality is in the coded paper industry, they absolutely need imports to fill the gap to fill about somewhere between 25 and 30% of the market just to keep everything in balance. And the uncoded market, that's not true. It's actually an oversupplied situation where most uh, in North America in uncoded free sheet, we have more capacity than we have actually demand. And so that's what makes it a little harder sometimes for imports to gain share. Um, and so again, this is a, you know, we've yet to see the level of imports really settle out because you know, everyone's waiting on the steady state. And I know uh, all the mills are anxiously looking at this data every month to see, you know, kind of where um, this all progress is. And so here's a way to interpret this chart. So this is the, the blue represents the, the amount of imports and the green represents uh, North American shipments. And this gray line, if you will, is the share of North America, right? So what's the percentage that North American producers a Sappy and a Verso and, and such produce versus what comes in offshore. And the reality is if you go back to kind of pre-pandemic, uh, that number got down as low as 29% was coming from, from North American producers. Now there was a, a lot of things that led in here because of the shutdown in Luke and the shutdown um, of, of several other facilities, right? So it's it's always been, a, it's kind of been in a declining pattern, but the industry absolutely needs imports to be able to survive. And so what you've seen is now all of a sudden, almost 60% of what North American producers uh, are producing uh, are represented in their share. So it's now starting to come down as Asian imports are starting to come back. And the question is, how much will they come back and how significant will it be? Will there be another blip? And the other reality is that input cost pressures are absolutely real. We can't stick our, our, you know, we can't be an ostrich and stick our head in the sand. Pulp has gone up, like we discussed. Natural gas is up, freight is up, labor's up, benefits are up. Uh, all of these create cost headwinds that suppliers have got to overcome or they've got to pass on. This next slide really kind of talks about that gap, if you will. And the reality, so this is a, this is between uncoated free sheet and coated free sheet. This is the, the, the purple box represents the cost headwinds that the producers have faced relative to the pr net price changes they got and what's left to get in terms of a dollar per ton, right? And so there's about a, uh, we'll call it an $8 a ton gap right now in coded free sheet. The cost they've incurred versus the prices they're getting, that's an $8 gap. The reality is uncoded, it's much bigger right? That's a $31 gap. Uh, and keep in mind, this does not include any Q2 cost headwinds. So as gasoline and diesel continue to go up, as you know, labor continues to go up, um, as all the inflationary cost pressures go up, that's not reflected in this slide. So input cost recovery is a real situation. That's why I say four and three, right? You'll, you're going to see those come to pass this year. So let's look at who are the players that are left, right? For, so first of all, for the coded free sheet marketplace, keep in mind that this is uh, 2021 data. 
Um, and the reality is that the North American industry, like I said, is insufficient in terms of being able to satisfy all the demand, right? So the demand is 2.6, supply is 2.2. That creates a kind of a gap, if you will. That means that 78% of, of what the market needs can be produced in North America. So it definitely needs imports. Here are the breakdowns, Sappy, Verso, um, you know, West Rock's in here because of, uh, you know, Bristol's are in fact, so, you know, the Tango's of the world, you'll see Tango's are represented here, Spectro, Proto are all kind of in here to some degree, shape or form. And you've got kind of all the other guys. And so these are directionally correct. Um, the, the challenge is everyone's got a slightly different view on the market in terms of where this all pans out. So this is just a kind of an industry source uh, analysis, if you will, of, of where the market really sits. The uncoated free sheet market is a little more fragmented, right? And so because it's fragmented, it, it helps to keep it in check. And the reality is it's a, it's a, uh, it has excess capacity. So the demand is only six point, call it 6.4 million. And there's almost 7.6 million tons of capacity around. So there is absolutely excess capacity. So again, that's why you see pricing dynamics that coded tends to be a lot more volatile than uncoded. And it's because, first of all, the coded market needs imports to survive because they don't have the ability to produce everything that's needed. In the uncoded space, it's not that's not the case. It's you know, you've got a it's a much more fragmented market, and you know, you've got the uh, ability to have others kind of fill the gap as as need be. Keep in mind, this is 2020 data. So 2020 data, not 21 data, because we're still determining the impact of Boise Jackson, the app beyond conversions and closures. And the reality is that basically North America um, has excess campaign and the demand right now, excuse me, imports are less than 10% of this market where they represent somewhere between 24% and at their high water mark, they may have represented as much as 50% uh, in the coded free sheet market. We're gonna talk about allocation because I know there's a lot of concern. I talk to customers and they get frustrated because they hear the term allocation. You talk to mills, no one wants to use the A word, right? They're all dancing around and they all wanna say, well, I can't, we're not on allocation, but it's a soft allocation, right? So what is a soft allocation and, and how does that you know relate? So I wanna give you this perspective. So, because it's very similar to the story I told you about you know, Nike and C.H. Robinson and being able to get on a ship. So the way allocation tends to work is at, from a mill perspective. And again, I used to have to sit in the chair. It's an uncomfortable chair when allocation comes. you got to be the judge, jury, and executioner of saying, okay, here are the grades for a given grade. Here are all the customers that are have bought from us over the last six months. And here's their volume levels. And you're trying to decide the margin stack. What's the most profitable that goes up top? What's the least profitable goes at the bottom. And so where your business fits in that margin stack is absolutely important because when it comes to allocation, they basically start at the list, top of the list, and they work their way down. The reality is that allocation not only goes down by grade, but it has to go by production path or machine that it's going to ride on because it may be a lightweight machine or it may be a heavyweight machine. They need to keep the machines full. And so someone may actually have a, lower margin stack product, um, you know, but because they ride on a machine that needs to be filled up, they get capacity, they get allocation. And so keep in mind that suppliers have to make these allocation decisions on a monthly and sometimes weekly basis do these supply demand changes. And that it's really also the, the other com competing factor is it's also what are the pieces of business are these things tied to? Are there pieces that are kind of tied together? So they literally, at the beginning of the month, they work their way at the top and they fall their way to the bottom. And if there's a machine shutdown, if there's a machine outage and they don't get all the way to the bottom, guess what? They're going back up to the top next month, okay? And so a lot of times customers ask, they're used to asking the question, you know, hey, I'm calling, I need price and availability. And I, our sales rep, Kevin Andalero, may have said it best when he said, really the question now has become, it's really a matter of at what price do I need to be at to have availability, right? And so that's the, the, the message or the thought that I want you to, to get in your head. And again, it's a short-term absolutely issue, but this is how allocation absolutely works, right? It's a more matter of what price um, that you can secure volume versus 
pricing and availability. And oh, by the way, you know, you know, in this case, because this piece of business is tied to that piece of business and it's the top of that margin stack, that customer is going to probably get both. And that means, you know, this customer probably doesn't get, um, you know, this JEF doesn't get the tons because this customer in fact moves up in the, in this grand scheme of things. And oh, by the way, guess what? Supply chains, latex, the latex shortage can absolutely play havoc as well because yeah, they'd love to be able to make that gray, but guess what? Because they can't get access to latex, you know, now you can't get on that machine with that grade. And so, yes, you may have, your product may have been in the margin stack and you may have thought you were taken care of, but because of a raw material issue, again, everything in this industry, and I used this term when we were in, in January, everything is balanced on a knife edge. Everything is absolutely balanced on a knife edge. There's just not enough shock absorbing capacity one way or the other, supply or demand. Uh, it's going to take a while for everyone to kind of get used to. It's kind of like watching uh, an automotive manufacturer deal with just-in-time inventory when you get peaks and surges, both in supply and, and demand. So let's talk about an outlook. From a pricing standpoint, um, this is the exact same slide I showed in January. So the forecast that, that's been put out there and the forecast that I would concur with would absolutely, I believe, hold true in terms of you're going to see cut size demand start to rebound at 10%. As schools uh, reopen in the fall, businesses, you know, start come back to some level of um, participation. You know, opaques are going to continue to to kind of be, be a little down, just from the standpoint of um, you know their usefulness. But uncoated free sheets going to grow four percent. Coated's up three and a half. We're already starting to see that. There's where you see the price, you know, projections start to lay out. We all got to realize that you know these you know cost increases are real. The input costs are real. Um, and, you know, in the, the challenge is going to be how fast can the imports restock the supply chain, not just once, but to be a long-term durable source of supply. That's the challenge because anybody can get a container shipped in. It's a matter of getting that container to be able to show up on a repetitive pattern that says, I know I can trust it every 12 weeks, every 16 weeks, whatever it is, you just got to hit it. Okay. So I look at opportunities in 2021. Again, these don't change, and I'm and I'm dead serious. Know you know as 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 a customer, know what is your right to win. What are you good at? You absolutely need to know that your your folks need to evangelize it. Supply chain partnerships absolutely do matter. They absolutely do matter. I've talked to so many customers that have bounced around and played the games, and they find themselves on the outside looking in when kids go get kicked picked for the dodgeball team, right? Because they're friends with nobody. Right, that's the challenge here. Right, if you if you deal with everybody, you're important to no one, uh, and that this erratic recovery is leading to sporadic demand, uh, and quite candidly, proactive engagement with partners. And we always say good news early or bad news early is better than good news or bad news late. Being transparent helps everybody in the supply chain, and suppliers aren't interested in swap swapping share. Meaning, if I take that business from you, I'm just going to watch my competitor take other business from me at the same price point. And I did a lot of work and I got nothing for it. So just be mindful of that and understand what is the value of a stocking merchant. So NPTA put this out and I'll share it, but you know, the, the reality is, you know, a, a merchant now is your greatest ally because we can become that shock absorber that I talked about, right? We can carry inventory on the floor and I'll talk about specifically what Millcraft is doing to be that shock absorber. But local dedicated inventories, you're able to get regional spend, you're able to bundle with complimentary products. That last mile of delivery is the most expensive leg of the trip. It absolutely is. I call it the Sherpa effect. There's a lot of stuff going on, right? Everything I've just talked about over the last hour, your, your, your mind's probably boggling. Keep in mind that your merchant partner knows, has a pretty good sense of what's going on and they can help you navigate. They can help get you a product selection and a supplier fit so it matches. And they can help you explore strategic alternatives, right? And what does that mean to you? Improves your working capital and it gives you sales growth by an efficient response. I can talk to one person and I can get the job done versus combing the internet and trying to find somebody who can help me out, right? That's what a supply chain partner can really do for you. Moreover, what Millcraft is doing, right? We've increased our stocking position by 35% in just the last 90 days. We're putting our money where our mouth is, folks, right? 
we committed to a hundred dollar in stock guarantee performance guarantee there are 350 items of not just kind of everyday run-of-the-mill items we're talking targets and a's why did we do that to enable you to depend on bedrock so that you can go win and earn business as the economy starts to rebound right that's what a partner does they've got your back when they when you need it most you know, if I think about, you know, there's the $100 in stock guarantee, we order mill direct, we're bypassing the RDC, or other suppliers uh, are potentially waiting for RDCs to come back in stock, we're not, right? We are ahead of the game. We are actually pulling and making orders from the RDC, they're shipping directly into us, because we have a unique advantage. And that's something we lovingly referred to internally as Nighthawk. A dollar invested for one is a dollar invested for all. So of the call it $26 million in inventory I'm setting on, if you're a customer in Ann Arbor or you're a customer now in Tennessee, you have the ability to get that product moved to you, okay? I know for a fact that other merchants in the marketplace have actually pulled back on their intercompany transfer. I've talked to customers, been down here in Tennessee, and customers have talked about another competitor of ours that killed their intercompany system because you know it was too costly in their mind. In our, in our minds, it, you know, don't tell Travis this, he would love to have two or three of them, right? It is an indispensable weapon for us. And more importantly, it's a weapon for you as a customer, because at the end of the day, Millcraft can become your greatest competitive advantage. And that's a fact, because in summary, you know, and again, I've given you a lot of information. I know that, and I'll be available for questions afterwards, email me or whatnot. Uh, the team knows how to, to get a hold of it. There's a lot of things going on, right? Um, the, the things that I said in January, absolutely holding true. You know, the word volatility is now more than ever. Be mindful of where the imports are. Know that the container access is what's keeping kind of them at bay a little bit. The rate at which the economy rebounds will also be a pacing factor as well. Cost input pressures are absolutely real. Understand what are you doing to make sure that you're able to, to, to keep a, a full employment. Um, challenge yourself. There's some really cool concepts uh, that are out there, and I'd love to, to talk to you. Uh, and I, our team would love to talk to you about some of the things we're trying to do because we're not trying to stay still. We're trying to be different and go 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 do something, right? Plan, do, check, act. Go do it on a small scale. See if it works. If, if so, great. You know, implement it. If not, kill it and go do something else. And the supply chain partnerships – absolutely do matter. And I'll be in with the beginning. Uh, I want to thank all of the supply chain partners that help pull all this together. Your being able to ping off you, your thoughts, um, your kind of where your head was, what, what you thought were the driving factors is absolutely uh, been wonderful and it's manifested itself uh, in the presentation. All right, that's it, Jill. Thanks, Greg. That was packed with really good insights. Um, I hope that this was beneficial to our audience. I believe that it was. And for those that were paying attention closely, I think the big thing is Greg mentioned, think of Millcraft. Um, we've been here, you know, as your partner in this, you know, we came off 2020 celebrating 100 years as a local independent merchant. Um, we kicked off 2021 with expansion and growth and we're here to help you. We are invested in your business um, and hopefully you see that in these types of things. Quickly, Greg, what I wanted to um, see within, I think that we did a good job addressing some of the questions in the chat. There was one that came over towards the end, um, was asking specifically, why did 2022 trend down on all fronts on the forecasted demand and pricing slide? chart seem to show slight growth for 21 and 22? Good question. So what most, most folks would believe is that as the economy kicks up, obviously it's a, it's a supply and demand balance. There's a belief that secular decline continues to happen in print uh, in 2022. And, and that's just, you know, you know, the, some of the things that we've all felt in some of um, the kind of the uh, things that COVID exposed. I don't know that COVID created any new demand destruction elements, I think it merely accelerated them, right? It, it brought things that were maybe out on the horizon and brought them in five years. Um, those uh, potentially, at least in some forecasters' mind, believe that those 
can likely return in 2022. And so that's really the what's driving it is everybody right now. And again, any anytime we're, you're you're forecasting things that are up and you up close in the windshield are maybe a little more accurate than the things that are out. But that's kind of the rationale behind why there's a belief that you know demand will kind of fall off compared to 21. And again, part of it's a hockey stick, right? You know, everybody's going to go out. Why? Because we now can go out. <laughs> when maybe we not we wouldn't have gone out in the in the past so you know that would be my rationale great thank you so much um again if you have further questions please reach out to your millcraft rep to myself or terry um, we will be happy to forward these along to greg and if you would like this presentation available for your team or your customers reach out to us and let us know that we this is one of the, the things that we do at Millcraft, um, as Greg mentioned at the beginning, we will be sharing the recording with everyone um, when it becomes available. So stay tuned for that. Thanks so much, everyone.